So, my apologies for that weirdness. Equipment failure, for it's sure. Fault. It is my blame fault. You. I would agree. You can blame me. You Throw me under the bus, please. All right. So, uh, on this on this problem here, put that away because that's not it. No. <clears throat> so, on this problem here, this is a um, this is a order of operations problem. Remember, on order of operations problems, we start inside the innermost parentheses. Right, we have two sets of parentheses. One is the square brackets, and then we have the inner parentheses, which is the rounded brackets. So I'm going to handle what's in there first. So I have 2 cubed minus 10 times 4. Notice how everything stays the same except for what's in those parentheses. 18 minus 2, that gives me 16. If you want to stay absolutely safe on these problems, you'll just do these little micro steps for each line of your problem. It's when you do multiple things on a single line is when you get in trouble. All right, so I have negative 10 still on the outside, and now I'm going to handle things on the next innermost parentheses, these guys here. So I have, whoops, that looks a little weird. So I have 10 times 4 minus 3 times 16. What is that? Let me get my calculator again. 48? 48. Okay, so I have 2 cubed minus 10 times 4 minus 48. Uh, now we have to do the subtraction inside this parentheses. We did the multiplication first. Now we're moving to the subtraction. So we have 2 cubed minus 10 times 4 minus 48 is a negative 44. Okay, on this last line, I'm going to go ahead and complete this 2 cubed because why not? I have 8 out in front. And I have negative 10 times negative 44. That gives me a positive 440. And so this is 448. All right, so remember, start on the innermost parentheses and work your way out. OK, here's one where we solve for x. So remember. On this one, when we, uh, we have a situation where we're going to use the addition and the multiplication principle, we use the addition principle until it's time to use the multiplication principle. So we're going to use the addition principle to isolate this 2x. So I'm going to subtract uh, the constant from both sides. So minus 5, minus 5. These guys go away. And I have 2x equals a negative 1. Now I just divide both sides by 2. That cancels my coefficient of 2 out in front of the x, and I get x equals a negative 1 half. OK, so that is simple solve for x. <clears throat> ah, here's a great one. So it's very likely that on the exam I'm going to give you something like this, that if you just try and slug through it, it's going to be kind of confusing and weird. But if you just realize that all the denominators are 3, you can clear them all by just multiplying through by 3, right? So if I multiply everything by 3 here, and this is just the easy version of multiplying through by a common denominator, right? If I multiply by 3, in my 3 into everything, if I multiply into this first term, the 3's cancel. And I have 3x uh, minus the opposite of 5x. When I distribute the 3 into the 1 third, Right, the 3 and the 1 third cancel. And so this gives me a plus 1. Uh, when I multiply the 3 into the negative 1 third on the right side, the 3's cancel, and I just have negative 1. Louis? Yeah. When you do that, you don't do anything to the numbers above the line? No. Just the bottom? No, yeah, and, and here's why. Um, because when I multiply a 3 into, say, this first fraction, I say 3 times, put big parentheses around it, 3x minus the opposite of 5x, right? This is all just over 3. 3 over 3 is equal to 1, so we cancel a 1, right? And so nothing else cancels. The only thing we canceled was what, what it had a matching factor with on the bottom. And so in this case, nothing at all happens to the top numbers. In the cases when we have, like, you know, if there were a 6 for one of these denominators and we had to find a common denominator, you might have something left over as a coefficient of one of the numerators, um, but that's about it.
So yeah, when you see a problem with a bunch of fractions, immediately you should think, how can I clear that? Yeah. OK. Aha. Remember, one of these will be on the exam, right? One of these problems where I ask you to solve for a variable that's contained in two different terms. Sorry, can you go back? Yeah, sure. Uh, oh, <laughs> sorry, I didn't. I didn't actually finish solving that one. <laughs> thank you for thank you for catching me on that one. <laughs> All right, I just explained something random and then went on. Okay. <laughs> All right. So to solve this guy, I want to collect my like terms. I notice I have a double negative here in front of the five x, so it's actually three x plus five x. So that's going to give me eight x plus one equals negative one. I'm going to isolate that 8x by subtracting 1 from both sides, minus 1, minus 1. Those will cancel, and I'll have 8x equals negative 2. I go ahead and divide both sides by my coefficient of x, and that leaves me with x equals negative 2 eighths, which when I simplify it, it gives me x equals negative 1 fourth. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So, once again, uh, this one's going to be on the exam. Remember, we have the variable in question in two different terms. So the strategy for this is to collect, collect those two terms or multiple terms. It doesn't matter how many there are. Collect them on one side, factor out the term in question, and then divide. So here's how this is going to work. So I notice that the C does not contain a Y. I'm supposed to solve for a Y, like it says in the instructions. So I'm going to subtract C from both sides, minus C, minus C. So I have X minus C equals AY plus BY. This is where the magic happens. So now I have my variable in each term on one side. So now I factor that out. So I have X minus C equals factored out y times a plus b. Remember, factoring out is just the opposite of distribution. Yeah, and so if you can see that you distribute this y back into the a, b, and you get the same thing, you factored correctly. OK, so now here's the part that sometimes is a little bit of a leap, but just be confident and go through with it. So the coefficient of the y is the entire sum a plus b. Since we're solving for y, we're going to divide by that entire sum at once. So I say divide by the sum a plus b on both sides, a plus b. Right? The a plus b is just a number, so I'm canceling the 1 on this side. And I'm just going to flip this around. So I have y equals x minus c over a plus b. <laughs> Ugly a. A plus B. Okay. Any questions on that one? Um, yes. What's up, Gabe? So do you have to minus the C first, or could you just distribute the Y first? Um. And then so then minus the C. you could you could factor out the Y first. That would be totally acceptable to have the minus C over here and then factor the Y out. But after you factor the Y out, then you have to subtract the C anyway. Yeah. So whether you do it before the factorization or after, it doesn't really matter as long as you do it before the division. Yeah. I just usually say do it first just because it's easier to keep the steps in line if you do it that way. Oh, sorry. Um, it, that's an awesome question. It's not, it's not really needed. Yeah, and, and you're probably asking that because like sometimes I keep the parentheses on here and sometimes I drop them. Um, I do that sometimes at random, unfortunately. That's a bad thing, right? You can see I kept the parentheses over here, but then I dropped them over here. I did that at random, so sorry about that. <laughs> but in the end, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, the parentheses are just something to help me keep it straight. Okay. All right, and so if there were actually three terms with a Y in it, I'd actually put three terms on one side, and then I'd factor y out of all three terms. Then I'd divide by all three terms. <clears throat> OK. Number six. Solve the inequality. Place your answer in graph form. 
set builder notation, and interval notation. <clears throat> okay, so this is a great example because I'm going to have to divide by the coefficient negative 5 to solve for my x. What happens when I divide by a negative in an inequality? The sign yeah, so I'm going to draw my little arrow. I'm going to flip my little sign before I forget to. I'm going to cancel that. So I have x is greater than negative 25 over negative 5, which is positive 5. All right, now I'm going to graph this. Draw my number line. Label 0. Label the point in question, which is 5. What kind of dot should I put on this? Open dot, boom. Open dot, and my arrow, since x is greater than 5, they're talking about all x greater than 5, so my arrow goes to positive infinity. It can. It absolutely can. Yeah, they're equivalent. <clears throat> uh, so the only thing it can't be is a closed dot or a square bracket. Well, <laughs> those are two wrong answers anyway. <laughs> Okay, so um, now if I want to uh, if I want to denote this in set builder note or I'll do interval notation next because it's easier to see what I'm doing. So interval notation, remember, it's just the leftmost endpoint and the rightmost endpoint. The leftmost endpoint of this interval is clearly right here. So the number five, I put a round bracket, right, because it's greater than but not equal to, comma, positive infinity and it gets closed off with a round bracket again, because infinity never has a square bracket. All right, the last form, set builder notation, the goofy one. I have curly brackets. X is the variable in question, such that X is greater than five. All right. There'll be at least one problem on the exam where I ask you to give your solution in all three forms. <laughs> all right, so, ah, so now we have an inequality where we're going to be using both the addition and the multiplication principle. So I just go about solving this like a normal equation, uh, except for if I multiply or divide by a negative, I make sure to swap that sign. So I'm going to collect all my variables on the left, all my constants on the right, Take this variable 3x and move it over to the left side by subtracting it from both sides. Okay, and so that gives me a 10 minus 4x greater than or equal to negative 5. So I, I subtracted 3x from both sides. Okay, yeah, there's a little 10 out here in front. <laughs> um, okay, so now I want to take my constants and throw them over to the right side. So I have my 10 hanging out here. I'm going to subtract that from both sides. So I have a negative 10 minus 10. These guys go to 0, and I have negative 4x greater than or equal to 5 minus 10, which is negative 15. Now, I divide by the negative 4. And I'm going to draw my little arrow and flip this now so I don't forget. All right, and now I have x is less than or equal to a negative 15 over a negative 4, which is positive 15 over 4. Or 3.75 or 3. Or 3.75. 3. Okay, so <clears throat> let's go ahead and graph that real quick. Like Gabe just said, this is uh, 3.75. That sounds about right. I'm going to go ahead and mark 3.75. If you want to be really rigorous, you could mark the integer below it, but you don't need to. Um, okay, and x is less than or equal to 3.75. So what kind of dot or bracket goes there? Closed, exactly, or square bracket if you prefer. Okay, so I have my closed dot and I draw my arrow going to negative infinity. All right, so what should, my, uh, what should my interval notation look like on this one? Infinity. Good. And negative power. infinity. Negative infinity, yes. Right. And then 3.75. What kind of brackets should I close it off with? Um. Circle and then square. Excellent. 
right? Circle, because we never reach infinity. Circle meaning rounded. Uh, than anything nope, no. Nope. <laughs> okay. Unless you're the enterprise. <laughs> Possibly. Then break reality. <laughs> I don't know. Even the enterprise never grows. <laughs> All right. Hyper, or warp speed is no, it's not. Um, it's using an exploit inside the universe space time continuum that allows it to do instant travel, but it doesn't. Back to absolute values. <laughs> <laughs> you guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so these absolute value problems. Pay attention to them, right? Uh, man, it is tragic when I give you guys an absolute value problem and you write the wrong answer because I, it's really tough to give you partial credit when there's no work, right? And so when I say, what's the absolute value of negative three and you write negative three, it's tough for me to give you like four out of 10 points for that. <laughs> so just pay attention to what the absolute value problems are, okay? Don't rush through these. So this one, it's, it's really a pretty simple one, right? We just remember absolute value is the positive version of whatever number that is. So the absolute value of negative three is just three. If I have a negative sign out front, this means it's negative three, plus the absolute value of positive three, which is positive three. So this is equal to zero. I know, it seems ridiculous, but just be careful. <laughs> it's, I'm telling you, it's tragic when you get those ones wrong. Okay, the average problem, this is actually pretty similar to the one we did yesterday. Okay, Ted has set a personal goal this semester to never let his grades drop below an 80% average uh, at any time during the semester. Ted is taking five classes in which he has so far calculated the following four scores. Blah. What score must Ted have in his final class to maintain at least an 80% average? Okay, so, <laughs> so what we're saying, right, we're saying Ted wants to have a certain average uh, a certain grade in his final class to maintain an 80% average. So we want Ted's average, right? We want that to be at least, so greater than or equal to 80%. So Ted's average is all of his previous scores added up. So we have 55 plus 92 plus 75 plus 75. And the last one is just plus x, because we don't know what that score is yet. On the bottom, we put a line over all the, or under all those, and on the bottom, we put the number of terms on top of that line. One, two, three, four, five. All right, and then we write that as greater than or equal to 80. Okay, so now on this step, we want to go ahead and add up all those terms on the top. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> so that gives us 297 plus x over 5 greater than or equal to 80. All right. So at this point, you may be tempted to start doing some addition and subtraction stuff. But wait, you have a fraction here, which means you can just multiply through by something to cancel it. What are we going to multiply both sides of this by? I, heard, I think I heard multiple fives there. Good. So multiply both sides of this by 5. This cancels, this cancels, and I have 297 plus x is greater than or equal to 80 times 5, which is 400. All right, so now I want to isolate that x. I'm going to subtract 297 from both sides. And that gives me x is greater than or equal to 1, oh, yeah, right? Yeah, 0, 03. All right. Now, what did it tell us? Okay, it didn't tell us that we needed our answer in any specific form. This is a word problem. So, x needed to be greater than 103. So we go back to this word problem, and Ted wanted his, his final to be at least an 80% average. So, our answer to this one is that unless there's some heavy extra credit available, it's too late. Ted can't do it. He needs 103%. That's not really possible. So you would say Ted needs 103%, or you can say Ted's SOL. It's too late for Ted. <laughs> okay. But Ted, I love you, man, but... Uh, yeah. Sorry, bro. I can't get you out of this. Yeah, I should have done the math early. 
<laughs> okay. So um, the apartments in Erica's apartment building are consecutively numbered on each floor. The sum of her and her next door neighbor's apartment is 2049. What are the two numbers? So remember, in a consecutive number problem, no. you say the, the first number is n, the next consecutive number is n plus 1. And this problem, <laughs> and this problem is saying, uh, and you don't need to use n, you can use n, uh, you can even use n and n minus 1 in this problem if you wanted to. You just have to do it a little bit differently. Okay, so it says these two numbers added together equal 2049. So I say n plus n plus 1 equals 2049. I just need to collect my like terms and subtract 1 from both sides. So minus 1, minus 1, and I have 2n equals 2048. If I divide both sides by 2, that gives me... Uh, I think 124 or 1024. All right, so consecutive number problems, remember n and n plus 1. And I want to see that algebra. I got to see the n's or the x's or whatever you choose to use. No, it, it could be an x, yeah. It just, you know, I just want to see the variable and the variable plus 1. It could be a k, it could be a smiley face if you want to define it that way. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> All right, number 11. Okay, oh, this is a great, this is a great example of an evaluation problem, right? Um, so evaluation problems, especially the ones you're gonna see on exams and on homework, uh, they tend to be really overworded for something very simple. Um, this is only semi-overworded, uh, but this is an example with Boyle's law. You guys will see this in chemistry if you take that class. Uh, so this is a law that describes how the pressure of gas tends to increase as the volume of the container decreases. Uh, a modern statement of Boyle's law is P equals K over V, where P is the pressure of the gas, V is the volume of the gas, and K is a constant term. If we have a container of volume 22, Okay, I, I noticed that, so I'm going to say V equals 22. And a constant that is equal to 4, okay, K equals 4, what will our pressure be in the container? And I say, don't worry about the units, because we're not worried about those in this class. So all I need to do is plug those things in and then calculate. P is equal to K over V, K is equal to 4, V is equal to 22. Just going to simplify that a bit. Uh, and I think it's 2 elevenths, uh, and there we go. The pressure in the container is 2 elevenths. Don't worry about the units. Don't worry about the units. <laughs> you can if you want to, uh, but I don't give any, so, <laughs> so it's going to be tough. <clears throat> ah, there's one. Okay. Do you guys have this one on your paper? No? Okay. So the rest of these you won't have on your paper. Sorry about that. These are just, I think I did just three extras just to make sure that we were completely prepared. Yeah. So these are just three quick extra applications uh, just because there's so many ac applications out there in the universe uh, for this next exam. It's tough to fit them all into just one quick 11 problems. So let's just do three more. <clears throat> all right, so this one is uh, an area problem. It looks like a perimeter problem. So the top of John Hancock building in Chicago is a rectangle whose length is 60 feet more than the width. The perimeter is 520. Find the width and the length of the rectangle. Okay. And find the area of the rectangle. Okay. So here's my rectangle. Uh, this tells me the length is 60 feet more than the width. Okay. So I'm just going to call this side the width. Uh, which means that this one is the length, L, but L, the length, is equal to the width plus 60. All right. <clears throat> perimeter, the general equation for perimeter is P equals 2 times L plus 2 times W. So now that we know L and we have a variable for W, we're just going to plug them in here. And we know P, too. So P is equal to 520, 2L 
We know that L in terms of W is W plus 60, so I write 2 times W plus 60 plus the 2W just stays. Now if you reach this step and you notice you still have, oops, you still have more than one variable in here, then something went wrong and you want to go back, right? Um, if you reach this step and you have an L somewhere in the problem, uh, something went wrong, go back. At this step, we should only have one type of variable. So now we just go through and solve for that variable. So I'm going to go ahead and I have 520 on the left that just stays the same. My 2 distributes, so I can simplify. That gives me 2w plus 120 plus 2w. 520 stays on the left, and I combine my like terms. That gives me 4w plus 120. <coughs> I can subtract my 120 from both sides so that I can isolate that 4w. Uh, that gives me 400 equals 4w. And I think we can all see what happens next. We divide by 4 on both sides and we get w equals 400 divided by 4, which is 100. So that tells us W is equal, here, let's just draw another little diagram. W is equal to 100, right? We knew that the length was equal to W plus 60, so the top is equal to 160. Um, okay, so what did they want us to figure out, first of all? <laughs> so the first part of the problem asked us to figure out the width and the length. The second part asked us to find the area, okay? So we already have W equals 100, we can say L equals 160, and then we can say area is equal to W times L, that's the case for all rectangular figures, which in this case is 100 times 160, which is uh, 16,000. I did. Any questions about that one? Yeah. And typically, like on all these problems, if I ever have a case of writer's block, I typically write down the general equation and just start figuring out what I need to have to fill that in, right? If I write down the general equation, I can already see that I had the perimeter. I can already see that I need length and width. I just need to relate one to the other. <clears throat> All right. Motion problem. I wanted to give you guys one of these because these are pretty confusing. Right, I'll give you a couple of minutes just to write, write down the, the gist of it. Sorry I didn't put this in your packet. I know it's a pain. <laughs> it's awful. I know. Where, where did this one come from? Uh, I don't know. Oh, I don't. I'm not sure. I'm sure it came out of one of the books. I tend to have like all the old copies of the books in my office, and I just sometimes I just pull problems out of them. And then other times I just make problems up. Ted and his tests are always a made-up problem. <laughs> Some ugly decimal, right? That I didn't bother to calculate beforehand. Or when it's got a goofy name in it, because I all, all the characters in my applications are my pets. Bill and Lucy and Nami. <laughs> Three. <laughs> no, I told my wife she's not allowed to get any more pets for now. Okay, so we have this guy, his name is Gaston. Uh, <laughs> he paddled for three hours upstream and then for two hours downstream. His speed upstream was 10 miles per hour slower than his speed downstream. He traveled a total of 30 miles. How fast did he travel downstream? Uh, so the indicator that this is 
one of these two leg problems equals total distance is that it tells us, right, we have two clear legs to the problem, upstream and downstream, where these traveling at a different speed, and it only gives us one total for the number of miles. That's an indicator that it's, it's a problem where you want to add up the two legs individually. So our problem is going to look like this. Leg one plus, and actually I shouldn't even say leg one, I should say upstream plus I have only one very important question. What's up? Does anyone spit like him? Spit like him? Gaston. Anyone no, spit like Gaston? Just like Gaston. No, like Gaston. Is that, what's that from? Oh, okay. I was just laughing because Gaston's a funny name. Yeah. <laughs> or a cool name. Sorry if anybody's named Gaston in here. All right. <laughs> so upstream plus downstream equals total distance. And so we'll just remember, we'll write this up in the corner, distance equals rate times time. Okay, so <clears throat> so the, the variable in this problem is going to be the rate. Right? And that's because, right in this last one, they say, how fast did he travel downstream? We don't know that. So we're going to say, let speed, let speed downstream equal x. OK, so first of all, let's come up with a formula for his distance upstream. So all we need for his distance is his rate and his time. All right, his time upstream, it tells up here, it says three hours. So we're going to say three hours times something. All right, now we need to find out if his rate is just x or if it's something else when he's going upstream. So it says right here, his speed upstream was 10 miles per hour slower than his speed downstream. So his upstream speed, we're going to put as x minus 10. All right, now for his downstream distance, Right, his total downstream distance is his downstream rate times his downstream time. His downstream rate, sorry, his downstream time, excuse me, was two hours, just like they say here, two, times his downstream rate, which we have defined as just plain old x. That should be equal to his total distance, which they've said is 30. Everybody soak that set up in a little bit. It's a little bit of a strange one, right? So remember, this right here is only explaining his entire distance on leg one. This is his time. This is his, his rate. This one here, this is only explaining his distance on leg two. Right? This is his time. This is his rate. And so with those two distances put together, we get the total distance. OK? <clears throat> so. To solve for this guy, uh, we take it just like usual. We want to free our variables up, collect like terms. Uh, to do that, I'm going to go ahead and distribute this 3. So I have 3x to start out with, minus 30. That is plus the 2x, and that is equal to 30. Collect my like terms. That gives me 5x minus 30 equals 30. I am going to add 30 to both sides so I can isolate my 5x. That gives me 5x equals 60. Divide both sides by 5. And that gives me x equals 60 over 5. So x is equal to 12. OK, so let's go back up and see what that means. So that means that when he was going downstream, he traveled 12 miles per hour. That was really the only thing that the, the problem asked. So you know we don't need to say anything else. But we can see that the current must have been running at 10 miles per hour, right? Because he only went 2 miles per hour upstream. So that's the basic setup for that one. If you guys are having trouble with that one, come see me in my office or do a bunch of odd problems and see if you get the correct answer. That's another great way to handle those. Um, 
these kind of problems are in section 2.5. So, you know, I, personally, I, on this first exam, people have the most problems with the applications. So I would suggest uh, really focusing in on chapters 2.5 uh, and a little bit on 2.7. But 2.5 is going to be where most of the applications come from. <clears throat> okay, so if you're looking at this stuff and you're saying, man, this looks a little... Uh, it like, might be a little bit tough if I was on my own, uh, then you'll, you're going to want to study those chapters a little bit more. Okay, last one. So <clears throat> we have this lady named Sarah. She has an investment in JetBlue stock. It grew 28% to $448. How much did she originally invest? Okay, so this is a percentage change problem. So I'm going to say original. All right, the original. That's, that's the variable in question, right? We don't know that. We're going to call it x. The change, they say the stock grew by 28%. So that is plus 28%. And the new, that is $448. OK, so remember how these guys always work. Uh, I know I've used variables in the past, but I'm just going to write out the words this time. So you're going to say your original plus your change times your original equals your new. That's always going to be the formula for percentage change problems. All right, so we're just going to fill in exactly what we have. Our original was the variable, so original equals x plus the change times the original. The change was an increase of 28%, so that's 0.28 times x, the original, equals new, which is 448. Okay? So if you memorize that formula or if you put it on your note card, you'll never have a problem doing these. And it's okay to write out the formula exactly like this on your note card. That's fine with me. All right, so now we collect our like terms and solve. So remember, there's a little 1 out here in front of the x. So we're really saying 1 plus 2.8x. So we have 1.28x equals 448. And I divide by the coefficient, 1.28. Awesome. And that gives me, you say 315? 350. A nice even number. All right, so Sarah's original investment was $350, and her stock grew to $448. All right, and that would be the end of class today. So um, don't hesitate to.